Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of the United District Podcast. I'm delighted to say that I'm joined by football coach and analyst Harry Brooks. Harry, it's great to have you on. Welcome to the podcast, mate. No, thank you very much for the invite. I'm looking forward to it. Um, no, pleasure. No, it's, it's great to have you on and obviously you know, I'm, I'm sure a lot of our listeners will, will be aware of sort of your presence and, and, and yourself. But I thought just quickly I'd ask you for just a basic introduction of sort of who you are if people aren't aware of, of, sort, of how, sort of what what it is you do with regards to the football industry and sort of how you got into that. So if you could just please just give us a, a little introduction, that would that'd be fantastic. Yeah, sure. So I train and work with professional and academy footballers um, mm. outside of their clubs. This is done through training on a pitch, uh, providing extra coaching, um, as well as watching their games and providing analysis reports. Um, I also work with them in other aspects of their life, so it could be helping them with uh, potential transfers, getting them into clubs, mm. um, you know, mentoring and things like that. So, um, yeah, what I do predominantly, what takes up most of the time of my day, uh, is working with these uh, professional and academy players, making sure that, they, uh, that they're they okay and they can uh, reach the, 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 the levels that their potential um, says they can. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, just the way you sort of outline it there, I mean, it, it, it's everyone, I, I assume it's most of our listeners' dreams, basically, this job that you've got. And obviously, um, I'm sure you've sort of worked very hard to get into that. What was it sort of, did you sort of start off um, sort of doing, what, sort of, what was your entry level with regards to education? Was it sort of, did you go through like a sport diploma or something like that? Was that sort of your, your interest? Honest, from, from yeah, age? honestly, honestly, it was really, really basic. I knew from a young age, I mean, I guess like a lot of young lads, my dream was to become a pro myself. Mm. Um, I, I knew from a young age that it wasn't going to happen. Yeah. Um, but coaching was a passion of mine. Um, but I actually studied sports journalism at, at university. So um, ah. I, haven't, I, I haven't had a diploma in coaching. Um, I started off very, very basic. So I've been, I'm 26. I've been coaching for about, God, 10 or 11 years now. Um, mm. I first started really small. It was just, you know, just being like an assistant at an after-school club, um, a football club. And then just, you know, through time, worked my way up, um, got in touch with different people um, that are sort of like, wanted to, were doing things I wanted to do. Mm. Um, so there was, there was there's an independent academy, which I still work for, called Round World Academy. Mm. It helps bridge the gap between professional and academy football and grassroots football, sorry. Um, so I ended up working for them, and I still yeah. do for years. And just over time, I just got my experience and just it kind of led to where I did now. Um, you know, my first my first ever my first ever role in, um, and you do need a bit of luck, but I'm a big mm. believer in, you know, you, you, you get back what you put out. Um, yeah. And I've always been a hard worker that's always had a lot of belief. And... Um, I had a friend at school that went on to um, become a, an agent, mm. and um, you know he he knew I knew he knew I knew what I was talking about with football that I was able to analyse. And um, my first ever job in professional and academy football was he uh, he wanted me to go scout a um, his player that was playing for Aston Villa mm. under age in the game versus Chelsea. So um, he sent me down to watch the game um, at Chelsea, um, and I filled out a report on him, the player, as well as other players. I sent it back, and they said it was, um, yeah, it was, it was. The, the agent said it was fantastic, and it kind of went on from then. So from then on, um, I then got experience coaching, um, and just getting in touch with different pros and academy players. They got in touch with me, and it kind of went from there. So it's literally, it's no, it, it was no, it's no magic thing. Mm. It's no amazing degree. It's literally just through working hard and putting myself out there, and, and it's led to where I am now. Yeah, which I'm very, very lucky. So, sort of, you've spoken there about sort of how you sort of got into it, and I think it's good to hear from from sort of that you've come in from a bit of a different angle. You know, you haven't sort of you've you've gone down a different path with the, with the journalism, and I think that's always good to, good to hear, encouraging for young people who pick a sort of a degree or whatever, and and then to to be able to know that they can still go into other things is is obviously good to yeah. hear. Um, with regards to sort of what you do now, then, uh, what is the sort of process in you getting in contact or, or a young, uh, sorry, a young player getting in contact with you, and then then sort of you um, sort of working with them. How does that work, and what are the sort of process it goes through with, with you working with the young player? So, so generally speaking, it's kind of like um, it kind of like they 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 get in touch with you to be honest, um, because it's one of those when you know football can spread like wildfire, and when you do a good job for someone, it spreads very very quickly because they then they then tell their teammates. Mm oh, I enjoyed that session, it was so good, then they get in touch with you, and it kind of spreads really, really quickly. So, um, yeah, you know, the first ever professional um, that I trained um, was, oh, I don't know, maybe seven years ago. And uh, again, it was set up by an agent. Um, 
He knew that I was a coach. He'd seen me coach one-to-ones before. He thought I'd be good. Um, he knew I'd done analysis before. So he knew I was in and around the level. Um, and he set me up with the, with his player. And um, the player loved it. Um, mm. Really enjoyed the session. And again, it went on from then. So then, you know, other players see you train other players. They tell other players. Um, and it's all, it goes from there. So generally speaking now, um, players get in touch with us if they want to do work. Um, there might be the odd player that will send a message and will sort of tell them who we are or who I am because um, I do it with my colleague. Mm. Um and say if it's up, if you, if you know, a player that we know, we like, and we we rate, we could sort of get in touch with them and see if they want want to do extra work um, and show them who we've done. And then a lot of the time they'll say yes um, because they see that we've coached players they know or players they rate, mm. and it kind of goes from there. So once you do a good job and you know they get the first few, then it really it spreads really really quickly. Um, so that's kind of how it works out. So you know, you what I would recommend to people, anyone that wants to do this, don't mm. start thinking that you can coach professionals and academy players straight away you know i had to do years of experience coaching um other players you know coaching then teenagers coaching good semi-pro players etc to then give myself the experience and the knowledge of them being able to coach these players i was i was kind of living in that world um for a mm. while before i coached at that level because if i wasn't aware of that level and i wasn't aware of that world in depth then i wouldn't be able to give the knowledge that i could give yeah. Um, so you know, for me, experience is vital. It's vital. Um, but yeah, generally speaking, that you know, once you sort of train one or two of these players, it kind of it spreads from there. Really, as long as you do a good job. Mm. You sort of spoke there about the sort of word of mouth and and sort of you sort of using other players you've coached and using that to sort of lead into different sort of paths with, with other players and clubs. I don't want to ask you the sort of uh, the the question of who's the best player you've ever coached. I think yeah. that's that's unkind to probably a lot of the the magnificent talent I'm sure you've worked with. But are there any players you sort of you've you've coached that, that sort of stick out as names that sort of have massively excited you and sort of have, have blown you away, or is that perhaps a bit unkind to ask for names? Um, listen, there's loads of players I, I, I've trained that I'm huge, huge fans of. Um, mm. In terms of the talent and where they go, it, it's very difficult to say because if we speak about, you know, a lot of players they like to keep it private for obvious reasons. Yeah. But you know, there's a lot of players, you know, younger players as well. They like to raise their profile, so they put a lot on social media. So there's a lot of young players that I've worked with um, that, you know, I'm, I'm ha- I, I, I can talk about, um, you know, as long as they're not too young, but um, mm. because they've already, it's, it's, it's already obvious, it's already online. Um, so rather than sort of like sort of saying names of who I rate highly, because what you'll find is that everyone's career trajectory is different. Yeah, so there yeah. are players right now that will be playing for Man United under 23s or maybe not 23s, that's just quite far down the line, but maybe Man United under 16s um, mm. or so. And with all due respect, and it's horrible, they won't have any kind of career mm. yeah, in yeah. a few years' time. Whereas there are players right now that have gone down the semi-pro route and are playing men's first team football at 17. You wouldn't know who they are. But mm. in three or four years' time, they'll have a proper career. So, you know, when you're, until, you've, until you're an established pro, you've had all the minutes, you've got the, you've got the games under your belt, um, then no one can really tell. I mean, you can sort of like, you can give a very, very good educated reasons for thinking where a player will end up you can certainly sort of see what a player's ceiling might be mm. but you can never tell until they get on the men's pitch and until they get the the professional games under their belt then you know the everyone's career trajectory is different um so you can never really tell but you know there are some players with um you know that are exciting um, exciting young names that people will end up knowing about uh they will they already will know about um, but will end up knowing about very very soon but probably a little bit harsh to give um specific names <laughs> yeah no that's that's completely fair i i had a feeling that would be the case you know you, you it's completely a, a just i think response for that um and i think you're spot on and i think you know this is something that from a fan point of view we can be very sort of uh sort of i wouldn't say victims of but we can sort of do um with our thinking is, is sort of hyping players up as you say you know the, these young talents and then they they go on and as you say you know i don't want to be you know unkind to these young players but go on to you know not have the career um that was that was sort of tipped um and fans can sort of put put a lot of pressure on that and it's interesting that sort of from a coaching perspective you know that's recognized sort of as well um well we'll move on to sort of uh, manchester united um obviously there's a lot going on around united as there always is a lot of sort of tactical points and sort of analysis of managers and players that that you can sort of dive into i thought i'd sort of start off by asking you 
quite a general question about United, sort of as as we did in the last episode as well, because I think we're at sort of a halfway point now. Um, sure. Sort of just in in general, what you've made of United this season, sort of have you seen um, sort of impressive development when you watch United? Are there players who you think are starting to really sort of mature and and stick out to you? Just a sort of uh, a, a general sort of review of, of the season so far, if you could, please. Yeah, I really have. You know what? Fair play to Ole Gunnar Solskjaer because he had a lot of doubters. Um, mm. I wasn't too sure myself whether he, uh, over his you know, suitability for being Man United's long-term manager, but fair play to him. I think that you know they're in a, they're a club right now that's really in a good position to really go and kick on. And there were doubts before whether Ole Gunnar Solskjaer would be the correct man to be at the helm. But mm. I think he's proving as the season goes on and as his tenure at Man United continues that he really maybe could be that man. Um, of course, we won't know until Man United are truly expected to win the big titles and whether he can be the one to get over the line. We don't know that yet, mm. but I think he's definitely earned the right to be given that opportunity. He's proven enough because I think that what United's biggest issues were, and they still are, I think, and they do need to be fixed, I think that you know he's a manager that um, he, he likes to give his players, his attacking players, freedom. Mm. Um, for him to create, um, which works. When you've got phenomenal attacking players on the pitch and they're in a good rhythm with each other and they're connecting, they're combining, um, you know, it, it, Man United can go on a run and beat anyone because, you know, when you give those good players freedoms and, you know, as I said, they're all in sync with each other, mm. very difficult to defend against because it's unpredictable, there's quality, it's outstanding. The problem is that when you do give those players freedom and when you do play that kind of style of football that Ole Gunnar Solskjaer generally plays, um, the players have to be in sync. Yeah. And a lot of the time, they just won't be. And, you know, they'll go through ruts where they just quite aren't clicking on the same page. Um, and then what you kind of need when that happens, you need to, you need certain cheat codes or certain rhythms and structures to kind of fall back on. When mm. you kind of go into autopilot, teams like Man City and Liverpool, you know, they've been so good the last few years because it's, they've got their... They've got their set philosophy. They've got their way of playing and they can just sort of like repeat it again and again and again. They go into autopilot. The players know what to do. There's a nice balance there. Whereas Man United, sometimes they just look a bit too much where it's too much freedom. And if it doesn't work, then they don't really know what to do. So Man United are still a team and a squad that I think can go through a period of maybe one winning six games. Mm. And I don't think you can win a league title like that. You need to become that ruthless killing machine that, OK, it's not working. How do we still win this game? What are certain plays and structures and routines and patterns of play that we can fall back on that, you know, can get us the win, that can get us the 1-0 wins or the 2-1 wins? Now, what I have seen, actually, is a real development in Man United and Solskjaer mm. to actually win games in different ways. Mm. You know, you saw it last night. Extra time was a really boring game, arguably. Yeah. And then they just they came up, looked on into the box, got the winner in the extra time didn't play amazing football, but they got the win. And you're seeing that more and more now in Man United. But I still think that to get to the next level, they just need to become that next level. They, they, they just maybe that last little bridge that they need to cross. They haven't crossed it yet. And we let's see if they do cross it at some point. But um, I'm still yet to see if they can do that. Mm. No, I, th I think that's really fair. And I think the way you sort of spoke there about the front three sort of hits nail on the head, really. And it, and it makes sense to me sort of looking at it in that sense. Um with regards to, you know, it, sometimes when they're not on the, on the same page, you're not quite clicking. I think you do see that. I think, you know, praise has rightfully been directed at Marcus Rashford, who's, who has had a really good season by, by all accounts. But there are games, and I think, you know, he would say it himself, and, you know, a, a lot of United fans would say it, there are a few games, you know, in a row where you can, you can sort of go, I don't want to say go missing, because he's obviously still contributing in, in one way or another, but, but he's more quiet in a sense. And, you know, um, the Sheffield United game, obviously, which was a, a big sort of disaster for, for, for our fan yeah. base and sort of the, the thinking sort of, getting sort of too tied up in a title race, perhaps, uh, with the way we're thinking, but was a game where I think, you know, the front three, yeah, as you say, wasn't wasn't quite on the on the, on the same page. So, you know, I think that's that's really fair. Um, I was going to ask you about Oli. You know, one sort of criticism that's sort of levelled at him is he, that he doesn't have sort of a defining um, style, if you like, as yeah. a coach. You know, there's, there's many coaches out there, and you, I'm sure you know of them. You know, Jose Mourinho, you know, you've got, you know, obviously looking back at Michels, Cruyff, you know, there's certain managers with, you sure. know, they've, they've got certain styles. Do you see any sort of defining aspects of, of Solskjaer's coaching style? And can you sort of see a clear pattern in a way that he's trying to approach things? I don't think you need to have a specific style of play. It's the environment. So, for example, if you look at City and Liverpool, 
they've got quite set styles of play and it works for them. Mm. But if you even go back to obviously the greatest manager of all time for me, Sir Alex Ferguson, mm. you wouldn't say the Man United played in a certain style. They were fantastic. They could counter attack, they could dominate the ball, mm. um, they could go direct. You know, they, there was lots of ways that Man United under Fergie could play. And I don't think football has changed to the point where you can't have that anymore. I don't mm. see why you can't have, win leagues and win titles having being adaptable. I don't see why. As long as the environment is set, as long as the players are understanding of what's expected of them. And I do think that, you know, I think that it's very difficult to do what, it's almost impossible to try and recreate what Fergie did. Mm. And I do think that perhaps United could do with a more set way of playing, which the players are accustomed to, that they know what to do, that anyone, because let's say, for example, and it's a similar situation with Tottenham right now, where you're giving these players freedom, mm. you're relying on the important plays and the players to be in the rhythm with each other. Now, let's say the most key aspect of that is missing. Harry Kane for Tottenham and yeah. let's say Fernandez for Man United. Yeah. We saw what happens when Kane doesn't play because now all of a sudden, the biggest aspect of that team that was like, you know, providing the rhythm, providing the, the combination play is now gone. And where someone like Liverpool, where a team like Liverpool or Man City, let's say they're missing a player, the player that comes in knows exactly what's expected of them. They're playing that same way of football. They know what's demanding. They can carry on as they were. I don't think Man United can do that. I don't think that you guys can miss a Fernandez and still be the same team. Now, of course, you're going to be worse, but I think it will affect you too. Missing big players affects you too much. So for me, the most important thing is the environment that's set. It doesn't have to be a set way of playing. Mm. but the environment has to be there. Players have to know what's expected of them. Players have to... Players have, every time a player goes onto the pitch, they have to know what is going... what they What is expected of them. Mm. They have to know what they... What, and I just think that there's just too often where players at Man United, when it doesn't quite work, there's a little bit clueless. So I do think that Man United could do with more of a set way of playing and find more of a set way of playing and still tweak it per opposition. I do think that yeah. because at the end of the day... There's very few teams in the world that can go toe to toe with every opposition and back themselves. Liverpool got them stage, got themselves to a stage where they could do it. Now they can't maybe do it this season. There's very few teams where you can. That's why Arsenal used to lose all the time to the big teams because they weren't they weren't better than the big teams, mm. but they used to behave like they were. They used to go toe to toe and you know open themselves up, and they used to get battered by the likes of Liverpool and so, you know so. I do think United could do with having a more defined way of playing. I do think it would help them. Um, but the most important thing is the environment that's set. That's the most important thing. Yeah, that's interesting. I think it's a, it's, I think it's a fantastic point, uh, sort of comparing it to, as you say, Ferguson, who, you know, he did have sort of, you know, the counter-attacks. I think something that people always sort of hark back to a little bit and sort of the, the, the pace on the break. But as you say, you know, he was it, obviously, you know, he was a manager for a long time. It changed over time and it wasn't too definitive. I think, you know, perhaps the problem with that, with, with fan thinking... Is a bit of recency bias. I mean, we haven't seen. I wouldn't. I'm not sure how far we'd have to go back. Perhaps Ranieri's Leicester to, to find a, a yeah. Premier League winner that hasn't played in a sort of a very specific, sort of rigid style. I might be overlooking someone there by saying that. I think you know Conte and you know Pep, Klopp all play in certain ways, and I think that's perhaps why United fans have got a bit caught up in in you know looking at specific styles. But I think you know you make a great point there on the environment, and I think you know that's it, something that. Yeah, it's it's modern football, so you know mm. there's there's so much material out there for analysis. Now, it's one of our biggest pet peeves is that because the the recent you know cycle of football has been dominated by teams that are where managers like to take as much control as possible, mm. very routine based, very structured, set patterns, you know, circuit based training, you know, you know exactly what the teams are going to do. So now it's seen that, and you know, a lot of managers like with these philosophies, they they play like that, and there's nothing wrong with that as long as it gets results. Mm. But the problem is that a lot of people nowadays seem to think that unless you are a manager that does that, then it shows that you can't coach or that mm. you're not coaching. You know, there's nothing wrong with giving, as long as there's a structure in place and there's ideas, why can't you give really good players freedom? Why can't, why, why yeah. do you need to, why do you need to tell Fernandez to stick to this zone no matter what? Why, why, why can't you give good players freedom? Why can't that be successful? And yeah, I'm actually really pleased that you're starting to see actually you come around again where, these maverick talents are actually able to express themselves more. Players mm. like Jack Grealish. Yeah. You know, Deed Smith isn't telling him where to be, where to pass. Of course, there's basic structure, but he's playing with freedom. Whereas if you look at the 
the sides that have dominated in recent years, they have been dominated by teams that are sort of, you know exactly what they're going to do. Players have to stick to certain rules and certain zones. Of course, I'm not as harsh as that, but you know generally what I'm speaking. That yeah, it's very very a lot more strict. Coaches are taking as much control as possible in every phase of play, and I think that people seem to think that because that's been dominated in recent years, that's been the dominant teams that that's the only way you can play. And if you don't do that, then you're an outdated coach. I completely disagree with that. As long as there's ideas, as long as there's structures, I don't see anything wrong with giving players freedom. Mm, I th- I'm, you know what, I'm so happy you said that because that is, I think, a very sort of uh, gross sort of misunderstanding <laughs> from, um, from, our, from our, to be honest, I say our fans, you know, I think there are quite a few United fans that do think that way. But in general, yeah, no, I'm, so I'm happy you've said that. And, you know, I was reading a, a book, I don't know if you've read, um, Zonal Marking by Michael Cox, you know, just no, even... I haven't read it. Obviously, I've heard a lot about it, obviously, but I haven't read that. No, yeah, it's, it's the first chapter. I mean, basically, sums up what you've just said. It was the sort of comparison of Cruyff, who, who liked his individualism, against then one of his sort of understudies in Louis van Gaal, who was a lot more um, sort of controlling over his players. So, I think that sums up, you know, what, what you've just said. You know, the different different approaches. Um, so, we've spoken a bit about the attack of, of United. You know. There's a, a big debate going on at the minute, sort of with the number nine spot. Obviously, Anthony Martial was fantastic last season, scored a lot of goals and, you know, got a lot of plaudits and rightly so for that. This season, we've obviously brought in Edinson Cavani, who I personally love. I'm sort of wondering where you sort of stand on that number nine debate and who you think sort of fits the bill better for Manchester United at the moment. Oh, I, I mean, I what I will say is I'm going to give massive credit to Martial and Solskjaer here. Hmm. I never saw last season, I never saw that coming from Martial and I really like it because it just shows that there's just you know I think there's a big thing nowadays of like you know managers expecting to get as much money as they can to go and fix their problems and easy fixes oh I want this so go get me this whereas like well where's the coaching in that why you know someone like Martial right he for me he was a very quite a basic footballer before he could only play at certain angles sort of score certain goals that cutting inside and quick feet and then sort of like caressing the ball far corner very specific play Mm. But what Solskjaer and Martial have done is coaching. He's coached Martial and trained and worked with Martial to get him to be a player that can now play as a number nine with the game all around him, score different types of goals, make runs to the front post now to finish first time, combine with other players, you know, play with back to goal and then run in behind. So massive credit to him. But I just don't think that as a number nine, he's quite at the level to be a Premier League winner. Whereas yeah. for me... Anderson Cavani is. For me, Anderson Cavani, in terms of strikers I've seen, has the best in-box movement I've ever seen. Yeah. He's phenomenal because he's actually quite an average finisher in the sense of... Sorry, no, I worded that horribly. He's <laughs> a very good finisher, Yeah, but he misses, He has in his career, he misses a lot of sitters. He mm. really does miss a lot of chances. But the reason he scores so many goals is because his movement is so good and he continuously gets in those opportunities. And how many goals has he scored for Man United now where he's just You've just seen a, com- a, a complete understanding of where to be and where to move, how to time your run, what angle to run at, when to run across the defender, sometimes when to stay where you are. Um, yeah, for me, he should be the number nine this season that can play. And obviously, he's older, and you know, it's a weird season in terms of it's a weird season. Any the Premier League is an intense league anyway, where yeah. rotation is important. Let alone this year, where games are coming thick and fast. So I'm sure he can't start every game and play every minute. But I would look to ha- get him on the pitch as often as possible as a number nine. Yeah, no, I, I agree with that personally. Um, you know, I've always been, you know, I always sort of lobbied for us to sign him. I think we really, really lacked a player in that profile. Um, I think, yeah. you know, especially since Romelu Lukaku left, you know, we, we, yeah. we were calling out for a, a proper, a pro- I don't say a proper nine, but maybe a bit unfair. No, yes, yeah, so, yeah, no, yeah, you're right. Uh, uh, what people would say a proper nine, a pure number nine, yeah. you know, a, a traditional number nine. There's nothing wrong with saying that. Um, it doesn't all have to be fancy words and all stuff like that yeah. you know it's uh you're damn right yeah proper nine yeah I, I agree completely yeah no exactly and you know when we got him on a free I was I was very happy and I think this season as you say he's he sort of shown with his I mean his movement as, as you've alluded to is is unbelievable and he, he creates yeah. chances for himself with, with the way he moves um so yeah I think that's that's good that we sort of spoke about that at the other end of the pitch um it's not been quite as impressive hasn't sort of lauded as many sort of um sort of positive notions should I say um Last season, I think we only sort of conceded less, uh, only sort of Liverpool and City rather conceded less than us. This season, it's not been as sort of good. Do you, do you have any sort of reasons as to sort of answer what, sort of what's gone wrong at the back of United this season or anything you sort of pinpoint that needs perhaps needs tweaking? 
I mean, I think there has been a few individual errors. There's been a lot spoken about how Man United defend set pieces. Mm. Um, you know, and it's quite a boring answer. But I do think that... <laughs> I think that you are a top class centre back away from being a much better defensive team. I don't think that you are horribly unorganised defensively. I don't think that you're completely open. I think that, you know, I think when you've got the base of McTominay and Fred in front of the two centre backs, I think that you're, I think you're a good unit. Um, mm. I think that you could do as an, another six, more of a sitting six, yeah. um, to replace Fred. I do think so because I'm a big fan of McTominay. I think he should be in the team. Um, but I do think that, say, for example, Harry Maguire, mm. I think he's an excellent centre-back. I really do. But I think he's an excellent centre-back that needs to play with someone that makes him better. Mm. He's not, for me, he's not the dominating centre-back. Um, and yeah. I think if he has that, Harry Maguire will be exceptional. I think if Harry Maguire plays, against a, plays with a centre-back that perhaps is, more, is quite unreliable, you know, a bit risky, you know makes mistakes, I think it makes Harry Maguire look worse. Mm. I think that he needs to play with the centre-back that's dominating and he can trust and rely on and he will go through the roof. Certain centre-backs can come in, they can play with whoever. So someone like Sergio Ramos, mm. he can play, he will make any centre-back partner better. Virgil van Dijk will make any centre-back partner better. He'll mm. raise the levels of those around him. I don't think Maguire quite is good enough to do that but I think he's an excellent centre-back that if he's played with another centre-back partner like a Van Dijk, and I mean, every manager would love another, every manager would love a Van Dijk or a Sergio Ramos. So it's yeah. easier said than done. But I think if Man United could somehow get a centre-back that can provide that alongside Maguire, I think your defensive work will improve no end. I really, really do. Mm. I think that's something we've sort of seen, uh, to be honest, with when Eric Bailly plays. I think it's, you know, blatantly obvious yeah. that sort of, you know, we're just a better defensive side and you know Harry Maguire plays a lot better alongside Bailly and obviously the, the injury problems with Bailly have unfortunately been you know torrid yeah. since he's joined United um, so I think you know that's something we've always called for and and yeah I think it's interesting to hear that you sort of stand in that same sort of spot on that um, one of the sort of features of defending that's constantly sort of talked about and scrutinised and it's, it's quite obvious when you watch it it's sort of the narrow nature of the fullbacks when we get attacked sort of down the flanks you know you always see wan and I think wan more than Shaw, but Shaw as well, you know, at times sort of tucking right in, close to the centre-backs. What are the sort of benefits to that? And do you think that's the right way we should be defending? And that's quite a specific sort of question. Yeah, I mean, every situation is different. But generally speaking, obviously, if you want to talk about it generally, mm. when you're on the ball, you want to open the pitch up, make the game nice and big, look for space. When you're off the ball, you want to be compact, you want to condense the pitch, you know, not much space in between the lines. So obviously, you know, that's that'll be a part of it, the full-backs tucking in to help the centre-backs. And there could be so many reasons. It could be that Juan Bissaka doesn't quite trust the centre back, so he feels like he has to sort of like go a bit tighter in. It could be that Juan Bissaka wants back up himself. It could be apprehension. Mm. There could be so many reasons, you know. And it, uh, it, it's quite it, it's difficult to answer broadly. Um, but generally speaking, a lot of it, a lot of it is to reduce the risk in a player's head. To reduce the risk and. You know, it's more of a safe place to go and tuck close into your centre-back. It's more of a safe place. It can be quite risky to go out wide and engage and close the full-back, uh, close the ringer down and engage mm. over there because you're worried about now what's going on in behind you and you're worried about getting exposed 1v1. Um, you know, it, it takes... To defend on the front foot takes... It's risky and it takes character. It takes yeah. personality. And to do that, it has to be organised. It has to be structured. You have to trust your teammates. You have to rely on your teammates. And if there's any you know, chinks in the armour with that, and then it can go wrong. Yeah. And you've seen it with Liverpool this season, how open they've looked, missing Van Dijk, missing Gomez, their defensive issues. It's changed so much, you know. You see it all the time with, let's say, for example, there's a keeper that you don't trust that are behind the defenders. How much does it change the defenders? How they behave? They become more apprehensive. So, you know, you have to trust your teammates. You have to have personality. You have to have a good understanding and discipline of what is expected of you um, in defence and attack, and you know there could be a there could be a number of things. Mm. You sort of touched on the trust of a goalkeeper there. Obviously, you know the goalkeeper debate is one at United that's that's yeah. very sort of prominent at the moment. Um, do you think you know De Gea has made mistakes? There's no doubt in saying that in the past few seasons compared to you know the De Gea we saw before that, which was you know a goal probably the best goalkeeper on the planet by a stretch. You know, at least in my opinion, a ridiculous shot stopper sort of in his prime. Um, 
uh, beyond the mistakes, though, sort of, do you think the way he sort of commands his area? I know you sort of touched on it there. So, do you think the way he commands his area is isn't is sort of? I don't know how to word this, but it's not inspiring the defence, if you know what I mean, the way he's sort of commanding his area. Yeah, and sure. The way he's no, acting. Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. Yeah, um, he just hasn't quite been the same keeper the last few years, has he? Mm. Um, yeah. Uh, I do think there's an issue, and I think that, you know, he was an incredible shot stopper. The thing yeah. with goalkeepers is that, and you never know when this has happened, it can be, you can be an amazing, incredible goalkeeper, and it can com- change it like a flick of a switch. Mm. It could be an athletic thing, it could be a mental thing. So shots that were being saved before are no longer being saved in the same way. Silly mistakes. I think that, you know, I think that it's, it's reasonable for Man United if they were having doubts. You know, he's had a fantastic career, David De Gea, been a superb player for Man United. But I think that it wouldn't be unreasonable to think, do Man United now need to be looking for someone else? You know, do they need, do they need to trust Henderson or do they need to go out and sign someone else if they want to go on and push and win the league? Because... Yeah, I'm just not seeing that dominating, commanding, take charge of every defensive situation, get defence out of trouble, keeper yeah. that I was a few years ago. Do you know what I mean? So um, mm. it's a shame. And it, but it could come back around. You know, Lloris at Spurs, signing back to Spurs, he, he had a funny spell for a while. Yeah. But then since Jose Mourinho came in, he's been one of the best goalkeepers in the world again. Do you know what I mean? So it's a very funny position, goalkeepers. It, it, can, it can change it like the flick of a switch. So... It's a funny one. It's a funny one. Mm. No, I, I'm a big fan of De Gea. You know, he's, I've always made sort of bold claims about where I sort of think he stands, you know, with regards to all-time yeah. greats and stuff like that, which, you know, has, has caused a lot of controversy, I think, with my sort of strong <laughs> strong opinions on that. But um, I think there's something in that as well, what you say there about, about Lloris uh, at Spurs. I think, you know, I don't think I'm a big fan of Jose Mourinho. It's interesting sort of how how good a record he's had with keepers over the years. And De Gea was magnificent under Jose Mourinho, which I think is, you know, Another interesting point, just to note. Uh, not sure, sort of how relevant or, or prominent that sort of is, but um, it's an interesting one. Um, sort of last night at the time of recording, you sort of tweeted your affection for Scott McTominay in line yeah, with a lo- yeah. in line with yeah. a lot of the affections that I think United fans are sort of feeling for him at the moment. At the minute, sort of a, a fan favourite, and, and so he should be. We all love Scott McTominay, but um, could you just sort of break down why why you're such a big fan of him? Why you think he's such a good player? I mean, you said it earlier, like proper number nine. He's a proper <laughs> midfielder. He's yeah. a proper player. Yeah. Um, there's so many things nowadays, and I think that he's, uh, and I'm not knocking this in a way, but mm. I think that, you know, a lot of people, they've grown up by watching, you know, the, the players like Barcelona, sorry, the teams like Barcelona, and players that are very silky on the ball. They come towards the ball. So you're seeing lots of players now that, in midfield, that they only really function when they come towards the ball. They want to get on the ball and go towards it and, you know... But I think a lot of time that's quite a safe thing to do. Mm. Not many players nowadays, midfielders, make those runs ahead of the ball. Yeah. And it's a really important thing to be able to do that as a midfielder because, well, for so many reasons, too many to go into. And he's someone that is really comfortable with running ahead of the ball, um, playing behind the ball, box to box. Um, he's got a goal-scoring instinct to him, I think, that's becoming more to the fore. You know, really good timing of runs. Um, I think he's got really good technique on how he punches passes. He's got a fantastic engine, good level mm. of aggression and spite. Um, he's a leader, clearly. And um, he's got a fantastic engine on him. So I just think that there's a there's a midfielder there that is such an asset to have in your team that yeah. can, you know, get from one box to the other, can provide a goal-scoring output, can be a leader, can be can be disciplined if he needs to be. Um, I know he's not really positionally disciplined in that sense, but, you know, he, he does an honest job as well and that can't be disputed um or underrated sorry so i just think that he's just a dream to have as a manager um and there's a reason why Solskjaer loves him there's a reason why Mourinho got him into the team as a youngster mm. uh, these these players they can be the bedrock of your squads they need they're needed in the squad look at liverpool the liverpool team how many spe- how many creative midfielders have liverpool had in the recent years before tiago and maybe cater not too many you know but Intense runners, aggressive runners, um, players with fantastic engines. These players can't be ignored or underrated. So, no, I think he's a fantastic player. I really, really do. Mm. No, I appreciate you sort of you, you sort of saying that. Um, I think you tweeted something which I retweet, which is fantastic. Sort of talking about aesthetics as well, which I think is a key point in sort of people, um, yeah, sort of looking at players. And I think you know, think profiling players on Twitter has become very sort of interesting you know nationality and and height and and all sorts come into the way people sort of view players without sort of 
looking at it in a proper footballing sense, if you know what I mean by that. Um, yeah. Which I think is interesting. I think Tomane was, was sort of a victim of that, it's sort of very much in his early years, where people saw yeah. him as this sort of lanky, you know, young English lad, sort of thinking that he was sort of just average you know that's what that's what sort of springs to mind with that sort of profile unfortunately i'm not sure what the sort of connotations why they're attached to that but he's proven people wrong magnificently in that sense and you know long may it continue because you know when scott mctomay is playing well it's it's a it's a brilliant asset to have especially with sort of the goals he's sort of added to his game this season as well um yeah we know you work with sort of a lot of youth players and something that's obviously iconically sort of tied into the history of Manchester United. I'm, I'm asking you for names again, Harry. Unfortunately, yeah, go <laughs> but, for it. Um, just are there any sort of young players at United that sort of jump out to you as being, you know, very special and sort of ones to watch going forward? Charlotte Shaw Tire. Mm. Interesting. I mean, yeah, I've known about him for a long while. Um, the independent academy I work for, actually, I wasn't part. Of, I was I wasn't working for him at the time. Yeah, but they hosted a tournament. Um, it's called Round World. Hosted a tournament uh, a few years ago, um, which. Um, Bayern Munich came to, Man United came to, really impressive, but I won't go into that. Yeah. And he played, and he was just incredible. And um, so, like you know, he, he played against the academy. I think it was an under twelve tournament, so I was I was aware of him from like under thirteen, under fourteen. I think I joined the year after or so. Mm. Um, watched him play. Yeah, he, he's a superb talent. I mean, I I, I, I don't want to sort of put too much on him sort yeah. of straight away because there's a long way to go. Of course, there isn't. You know, you've already seen the amount of attention he's getting now already with his signing the new contract and training with the first team. But he's a fantastic player. He just has a complete understanding of the game. Um, he knows he, he he can create chances. He knows when to speed the game up, when to slow it down. He can provide the rhythm to the game. He can provide the final pass. He can provide the goal. Um, superb technique. Just a really outstanding talent. Um, and yeah, I have a lot of hopes for him. Yeah, that's interesting to hear and encouraging as well. You know, he's been a player that a lot of sort of United fans are starting to talk about more and more now. You know, Hannibal Mejbri is another one. Um, yeah. Obviously, you know, you've got bigger names as well, like obviously Amad Diallo, sort of the big money attached to him. has obviously gained a lot of traction. One player that sort of has been focused on um, quite a lot. So that's interesting to hear that sort of short ties, the, the sort of the one that jumps out to you, which is, yeah, it's interesting. I mean, yeah, there are, there are, there are some phenomenal... For me, Man United is my favourite academy in the country um, mm. for a lot of reasons. Um, but um, there's so many talents that play for Man United. But he's for me, he's the standout at the moment. He's the one. He's the next in line, I think. Yeah, I'll have to, I'll have to try and watch a bit more of him. <laughs> yeah. um, now we've got some questions from Twitter. Uh, thanks, everyone, sure. for the questions. Uh, some really interesting ones were sort of sent in. We've sort of narrowed it down. Um, if your question isn't answered, it's not that I don't value it. It's just that yeah. <laughs> we can't answer all of them, unfortunately. But um, the first one's from Daspa, who asks, who is your favourite player to watch and why? So sort of away from specifics, just in general, your sort of favourite player to watch. I mean, at the moment, it's... And it actually generally has nothing to do with being a Spurs fan. It's Tangi and Dombele. Mm. Um, I just love how unique he is in terms of his mixture of creativity, his genius, his technical attributes and his absurd physical attributes as well, all mixed into one. I love watching players like that. Um, so him, for me, I love watching Jack Grealish. I think yeah. Jack Grealish is a dream right now. He's It's so good to see these kind of players really come to the fore again. The Mavericks that can play with personality rather than the robots. I love it. So, um, yeah, and Dombley and Grealish isn't too far behind. Um, but I love watching players like Fernandez and Man United as well. You know, I love players that, that give it a go. They try things, you know, that it doesn't matter what their pass completion numbers are uh, or, or their, their shot accuracy. They give it a go. They try to affect the game. Um, so, yeah, I'm a huge fan of players like that as well. But, um, you know, and of all time, you know, I mean, you know, the likes of Lionel Messi and, R9 those players but at the moment Ndombele is probably my favourite to watch right now yeah yeah no definitely you know he's he's sort of you know the, the growth that Ndombele's had at Spurs is there for everyone to see I think sort of just getting into things a bit more and starting to you know really sort of solidify his place in the team um, which is good to see because I think you know there were a lot of doubts weren't there around sort of his ability and, and the way sort of Jose Mourinho was handling him so it's it's yeah not to, not saying it's good from a United perspective because obviously Spurs <laughs> Spurs have got a good player there in midfield, but um, but good in a sort of general sense for the for the player and for yourself as a fan a fan of Spurs. But um, yeah, Gr- Grealish is up there for me as well. I think Grealish is so fun to watch. I don't know how yeah. he'd get to United now, where he'd fit in or, or whatever, but yeah, I think you know spend the money, it's worth it. I think if Man United can do it, they need to do it. I really would. Yeah. I mean, he would he would just help elevate you guys to the next level. He really would. 
No, absolutely. I think he's, you know, the comparisons are made to Beckham and you can sort of see why, just the swagger and the sort of, the haircut, yeah, and the way, just the way he plays, everything about it. I do, I do really like Jack Grealish, big fan of it. So yeah, good, good to hear that you're, you're the same on that. Uh, ben MUFC asks, in your opinion, who is the most unique talent in England at the moment? Again, again, if I'm not talking about English talent, um, it's Ndombele. Yeah. It re- honestly, it really is yeah. that he he. <laughs> If you just watch him play, he does things that just are just so absurd. Mm. Technically, cre- creatively, in terms of genius, and physically. I mean, there are, in terms of physically, there are some times when it looks like his knees are like perpendicular to the floor. He's yeah. got that low, and he's twist and turned that aggressively. It's incredible how he isn't just falling over or how his knees haven't exploded yet. <laughs> but but yeah. in, in terms of like the creativity on the ball, the, the ability to... The, the, sorry, the, the creativity and the technical ability to turn away from pressure in different ways, find passing angles that weren't there. I mean, there was a, there was a, I slowed down a clip not too long ago of a skilly done versus Thiago Silva and N'Golo Kante. I don't know if anybody's seen it, but I mean, the footwork and skill and genius, yeah, for me, he's so unique. He's incredible. Um, just I mean, all of those aspects rolled into him. I think he's a, yeah, an absolute joy. So, yeah, for me, I'm sorry being boring. It'll be him again, yeah. <laughs> no, that's all right. I mean, if, if you're a fan of a player, I mean, you're you're a fan of a player. Um, and I think sort of some of the things you sort of described there, sort of the way he moves and sort of the, the angles he creates is very similar, pulling it back to a United perspective, sort of Paul Pogba. You know, it, sure. I, I think's, I think it's a very, just, I mean, unique is the right word, but just, just, as you say, sort of strange and just with the way he sort of moves and his build. Yeah. And the way he sort of controls the ball for a man of his, his height and stature, you know, I think's almost freakish. You know, it's, it's freakishly good. Yeah, it is, yeah. Yeah, it's a great profile to have um, in, in your side. A bit of a different question now from Mal, who asks for your top drills for a wide player. I'm assuming he is a wide player himself um, and asking for sort of, yeah, what are the things you sort of focus on uh, with, with wingers? I mean, it completely depends on who the winger is. So, mm. for example, let's say I had David Beckham in the twilight of his career. Yeah, I probably wouldn't do too much work on his dribbling mm. <laughs> <laughs> because you know that's it's kind of done now. That's the, he's not going to add that to his game in the same way mm. or driving with the ball, I should say. Um, so it completely, it can, it's a really boring answer. It completely depends. Um, I guess that certain attributes that or certain traits that players would need as wide players is you know, can you get separation from the man? You don't have to maybe beat the defender outright in one v ones, but can you work enough space to produce? And end product in some way. I mean, again, it's a really boring thing. I can't really describe a drill on, on sort of like a um, yeah. yeah, yeah, on a podcast. But um, yeah, and again, even every, every star is different. You know, as we said, you know, David Beckham, a completely different winger to Cristiano Ronaldo. Yeah, you know, uh, who's a completely different winger to Jaden Sancho. Um, mm. You know, it's about knowing who you are as a player and accentuating the positives, but also working on the weaknesses. Um, and brushing you up to make you more all-rounded. Um, so again, there's not. I, I'm sorry, mate, but there's not really a specific answer I can give to that. No, I guess I could give fine. certain drills that I do with players. So here's here's one that I do with that can work with a lot of wide players. Is mm. um, I learned it from my colleague Richard, who who went to Schalke Academy a few years ago and uh, for a week, and uh, mm. they've done this drill uh, repetitively, which is why you're seeing some outstanding ball carriers come out of Schalke, the likes of Leroy Sane. Yeah. And uh, basically, let's say you have um, six cones mm-hmm. and you put each cone maybe, I don't know, five yards apart at quite shallow angles. Not sharp angles, quite shallow. So, yeah. and then really, really simple. All you're doing is taking a touch per cone, um, playing on the edge. And it's kind of that idea of driving, but slaloming while you're driving at high speed under control. So, mm-hmm. a really, really simple drill. Um, quite difficult to describe um, on obviously a podcast yeah. without showing and telling but um, yeah there's there's one drill if somebody understands if they don't quite understand what I mean by that then feel free to send me a DM or whatever and I can uh, draw you a picture <laughs> yeah thank you very much I mean us, us, uh, thank you for, for describing that I think uh, you know as you say it's hard with, with the means that we've got here uh, the technologies but uh, that's, no, that's fantastic thank you for that um, I'm just going to go away from the Twitter questions a minute because you mentioned Jaden Sancho's name and obviously United fans, sort of, it's it's a light bulb in our heads when that, when that man's name's mentioned. You know, a player who's intrinsically linked to United. You know, every ch- single transfer window over the past sort of couple of years. You said there, you think you know Grealish is a player United should go out and get. Do you sort of st- do you stand in the same sort of in the same sort of way for Jaden Sancho? 
I would, in terms of what Man United need, I would get Jack Grealish ahead of Jaden Sancho. Mm. Um, I think that what Jack Gre- James, what they would both do, which would be good, they would help you retain the ball in the final third better. And I think you could do that because where you have a lot of players that are quite direct and they like to attack immediately, um, obviously moves can be quite, you know, they can be quite immediate, so they can break down. And then obviously you can be, risk yourselves to transitions. And I just think that certain times you need to be able to keep the ball in a more structured way in the final third for a little bit longer, sustain pressure. Um, again, Fernandez isn't really one to do that because he likes to sort of play the final pass immediately, get yeah. the shot away. Rashford, very direct. Martial doesn't really do that. Greenwood, again, about the end product. Having someone like a Jaden Sancho, he would help provide just that ability to retain the ball in there. He's good at sort of passing and moving, combining in tight areas. Um, so I think getting a profile like that would really, really help you guys um, to help keep and retain the ball in the final third, which I think is really important. I would go more towards Jack Grealish for profile um, instead of Jane Sancho. But listen, if you get Jane Sancho, it's hardly a bad thing. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that's fair to say. Um, we'll, have to, we'll have to see whether United go sort of back in for him. I'm sure we'll start hearing more about that as the summer yeah. summer sort of approaches. But um, yeah, one last question from Uche, uh, which is a is a great question. I think you know uh, one that you know a lot of people sort of talked about when they sort of you know, learning sort of how to coach and how to handle players. He asks, how much tactical instruction should you give to young players? And if a player says they're confused by sort of tactical instruction, how do you go about fixing that? Oh wow, what a question! Um... <laughs> Isn't it just? Yeah, so it's very difficult. So generally speaking, um, put it this way, without going too into detail, a nine-year-old doesn't need to know what a third man run is. Um, So obviously, as the player gets older, it becomes maybe up until the age of 12, it's technique, technique, technique for me, and basic understanding of the game. So for example, let's say you're coaching a seven-year-old. They don't need to understand in depth. They don't need lots of tactical instruction. It could just be like, run away from the ball. Like, you know, go away, go away, give them space, you know, because you get young players that crowd the ball and it becomes a mess. So as players get older, then the tactical detail comes more in depth. And for me, coaching is about understanding the points that you're trying to put across. Mm. It being a good point, obviously, uh, a beneficial point, but making sure that the player can understand it in a really simple terms. Yeah. I've seen so many coaches that, and I used to be quite guilty of this actually myself, that they would stop a session and then all they're talking for like two or three minutes or mm. two minutes or so. And they almost like they're showing off what they know. And I'm like, well, you've lost, you've lost the player now. Yeah. The point is gone. So it's about under, making sure your under, your player understands it in a, in as concise and as simple a way as possible. They might understand it through really complex language. And if it works for them, it works for them. Fantastic. But at the end of the day, coaching is and making sure that your player understands what is being told and being able to get that out of the player and help them improve it. That's what coaching is, you know. Um, so if a player doesn't understand it, how break it down in a really simple way, you know. And there's there's lots of ways to do it. Lots and lots of ways to do it. It can just be that while the session is going on, you pull the player out and you just say, watch this for us, watch this for two minutes and explain. It could just be that you're shouting as they're playing. It could be that you stop the session for 30 seconds. It could be you stop the session for a little bit longer. But it's all about making sure that the way you portray it, it's not about you as a coach. It's not about your ego. It's about do your players understand? Can they take it on board? And can they then work on that and improve on that and um, go with that? So that's that's kind of the best way I can answer that question. Yeah, that's, I found that really interesting. I was just going to ask you quickly, sort of on a, a sort of spin-off to that. Um, yeah. Don't want to keep you too long. But I was no, no, ask quickly with like, young players... Um, you know, I'm somebody who's never played at any kind of level other than sort of five aside and Sunday League when I was when I was really young. But, you mm. know, I'm somebody who's, I read quite a lot, and and I don't want to say I'm a student of football. I think that's quite, perhaps a bit of an over exaggeration, but I like to read about managers, philosophies, and styles. Yeah, yeah. How many young players do you sort of come across that read a lot of sort of football literature and and study in that way, or, or are they? Do you think you know at a young age? They're pu- most of them are purely sort of focused on playing football. So how many do you come across that sort of st- study the game a different way, would you say? Nowhere near enough. Right. Nowhere near enough. Yeah. Um, you don't have to read books and literature, but the best... But I ask players, one way I ask players is like, who watched the game this weekend? And mm-hmm. they'll all put their hands up. And they'll ask them to describe what you saw about the game. And they'll say goals, 
amazing skill, great shot. And then I ask, who actually watched the game? They said, what do you mean? Like, watch the game. Yeah. And obviously you can't do this for players too young, but, you know, from a young age, I, I was, like, watching the game of mm. football. I was, and this was me, I was, like, wasn't just looking at it for the highlight reels. I was looking at it in depth. I was trying to understand the game. Why did the centre-back push up then? Why did the winger go that side rather than inside? Why did... Why did he pass rather than, you know, lots of every little obsessive detail. And, you know, you have to understand the game. You have to understand the game. And, you know, yes, play, you're not going to get any better your education than playing the game. Mm. Players have to, to improve, you have to play the game. But you could do so much more to widen your knowledge and increase your depth. I think that, you know, players that go out and get their coaching badges and coach from a young age is a really good thing to do. It gives them a, it gives them a much broader perspective of the game. Yeah. Um, as well, you know. So I think that players, if they if they're really serious about their football, they have to be students of the game as well. You have to be a student of the game, just not just playing. It's not enough. Yes, play. Yes, train. Yes, do extra work, but be a student of the game and enjoy it. Love it. Love learning about the game. Yeah. It can be in different ways. It could be by reading literature. It could be by watching your favorite play. It could be by watching games and watching it in a more tactical way lots of ways to do it lots of ways to do it but you have to be a student of the game yeah I think that's I'm really happy to hear you say that as well because I think that's you know something I've always it's something I've just enjoyed to be honest you know I'm someone that wants to go into sort of journalism and, and something along those oh fantastic sort of lines yeah. yeah I've always sort of yeah been interested in philosophies and different managers approaches and players and styles and all that sort of thing and that's not everyone's sort of cup of tea but I think yeah I, I was that's why I asked you that question because I think that can be a massive benefit for players, you know, young players playing at any sort of level, really. Just to, yeah, as you say, watch in a more analytical sort of sense. I mean, you know, I mean, just even watching Edison Cavani's runs, I think you could learn a lot off just by watching him sort of off the ball running around um, and the way he sort of shakes his man. But Harry, it's been an absolute pleasure to have you on. I thoroughly enjoyed this. I, I love, always love talking to people involved with coaching because as I say you know I'm interested in learning sort of more and I'm so sure the listeners sort of share that as well I don't know if you've got any sort of last words sort of where we can find you and your work etc oh mate no it's an absolute pleasure thank you for having me on I'm really enjoyed speaking to you and um yeah happy, happy to do it um I knew I always get asked this when I go on podcasts and I always forget I think my tw- I think my Twitter is hp underscore head coach um mm. if players are, if people are interested in seeing some of the players we coach obviously we can't show all of them but uh we have an Instagram called uh, Royals underscore Round World. Um, so you can just see some of the players we work with. Again, we can't put everyone on there, but um, so there's that. But um, yeah, yeah, no, I really appreciate it, mate. Thank you for having me on. Harry, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, mate. No, thank you, mate.